Hi, good morning. Um, so um, today we're going to talk about tricuspid valve, in, tricuspid valve intervention and especially what we do here at St. Michael's. I think this is a great topic for echo rounds because uh, you know, patient eligibility and the intra-procedural success depends heavily on the echo. So all the hard work we put in and screening these patients, we have our long studies, we spend a lot of time doing these. So it's nice, as you will see, that patients do benefit from this hard work and we do uh, improve patients' uh, care. So that, that's a good topic. So, Okay, skip page. You roll it? Uh, photos, how do I, okay. Yep, click on your oh, slides, yeah, there you go. Yeah, I won't click. So, well, um, it won't be fully echo, but I think it's nice to talk a bit about tricuspid regurgitation itself and how it affects patients with heart failure. We're going to see who, uh, which patients are suitable for a trans catheter valve intervention, and we'll I'll present a few interesting cases we had uh, through the lab. So, um, tricuspid valve, I guess, uh, the awareness of tricuspid valve um, as a disease that impact patients first started about maybe eight years ago. So we knew patients had TR, but we didn't really know what to do and what the significance. Uh, uh, was it until a few a few years ago? So what we know for sure is that uh, TR is quite prevalent. A lot of patients, for sure, with mitral valve stenosis, mitral valve regurgitation, do also have concomitant tricuspid regurgitation. Patients with aortic stenosis often have tricuspid regurgitation. Patients with long-standing atrial fibrillation with dilated uh, atrias also have tricuspid regurgitation. So a lot of patients have tricuspid regurgitation. And why it's significant is that we found out that this disease on itself is associated with mortality, independent of what other disease they have. So on itself is a marker of risk for, for uh, mortality. And what we also found out, which is also significant, is that patients do progress in time in degree of severity, especially patients with mitral regurgitation or mitral stenosis, and even patients who had surgery to correct their mitral valve disease, with time, the TR will progress. So you say around five years or so, the TR can go from mild to severe, with or without surgery. So we often see that patients that have been followed for a long time here in the lab, the time you can see throughout the year, the TR progress. So that, that's kind of the natural history of this. So knowing all this, uh, despite knowing all this, rather that this disease is quite undertreated, and it's undertreated because we don't have a good way of treating it uh, at this time, because it's so new. So, um, before all these transcatheter intervention, the only way to fix it was with surgery. So with surgery, we can either replace it or repair it, and repair we mean uh, putting a ring, uh, an annual plastic. So um, here's a graph of surgical literature, like since uh, 2004, you can see that there has been an increase, kind of an awareness or an increase in, in the number of surgery that has been done. That's in the US. Um, and what's striking here is this uh, gray line, the mortal intra-op mortality is 9%, despite the advances and the advances in surgical techniques, and you know, the more uh, knowledge we get of the disease, despite that, the intraoperative mortality is quite really high, which is it's quite significant. So this data is a bit of blend of everything. It's a bit of a blend of uh, you know patients, young patients like uh, IV drug users that underwent isolated replacement. They obviously tend to do better. Patients with like primary trichosis valve disease and they get isolated surgery usually tend to do better because they don't, they're not sick otherwise. Uh, but that's only a small portion of all the patients with TR. The majority of patients with TR have functional tricuspid regurgitation, and these patients have a lot of comorbidities. And that probably explains or drives this increase in mortality. 
So we're, we're kind of stuck there. So as a general rule, I would say, we don't perform isolated tricuspid valve, surgical tricuspid valve intervention uh, in patients, you know, with comorbidities. It's, it's yeah. So, so, um, so with that known, then this was all this interest in trying to uh, find a less invasive way to, to fix the valve. So um, here's a bit of a landscape of everything that's available um, everywhere. Uh, we can break down the transcatheter devices according to their mechanism or the, the, which uh, anatomic feature it targets. So we have valve replacements, we have leaflet approximations with clip, like clip devices, we have annuloplasty uh, ring devices, uh, we have cable uh, devices, and, and uh, different types of cable devices. So the only device that's commercially available is the Abbott Triclip. So, the triclip is a mitral clip, uh, but with a different delivery device that has steer, uh, other types of steering that's specific for the tricuspid valve. Uh, that's the only one that's commercially available. All these other devices are still under study at their various, uh, the, the, you know, uh, in the evolution of study at various degrees. So, so the only one commercially available is the triclip. So at St. Mike's, uh, we, uh, I guess we, we have the biggest tricuspid valve, um, transcatheter tricuspid valve program in, in Canada, and we have access to, to different devices. So the way we get access to these devices is with um, a mainly Neil, uh, Neil Sands um, uh, renowned. Uh, so we often uh, go to different meetings, meet with sponsors, look at the devices, look at the data, and talk to our colleagues in US sites that have done these uh, before or enroll in patients in different studies. Um, and that's how we get access to them. And then once we identify a device that we feel would be beneficial, then we go through a Health Canada process to get them approved. And then they're part of a research study and that's, uh, that's how we get that's how we get so so that's why all these studies the echoes we do and we're very um, mindful of the time frame of when the study is done the transthoracic and the TV uh, because all these sponsors that you know we get special access to use their device they have really strict criteria how we can use them and to have you know most recent data of imaging is very important to them so that's why we end up sometimes having to repeat them because we're out of range of it. And each device have different kind of timeline regarding the, when the suspend goes fail. So uh, at St. Mike's, we have different categories of devices. The first one we use more often is the, the triplet um, and the Pascal. So these two on top here are the Abbott uh, mitroclip devices. So they're, the fourth generation have two sizes of devices a smaller one um, and a larger one. So the smaller one is called MT and the double G stands for wide. So the, the clip is, the width of the clip is wider than the, the third generation. And then we have a XTW, which is a longer clip. So the arms here go up to 12 millimeters and the shorter clip has a, a waist length of nine millimeters. So those are the, the triplet. And here, down here, you see this is the Pascal clip that's made by the company Edwards. And it's a clip as the same way, but it has a little different features. Uh, the grippers are different, and the width and the shape of the, the grasping device is different. So it's a clip, but it's a little different. So we have these clips, that what we do the most. And then we have replacement devices. These are all the devices we use, we have used. So the first device we used was called a navigate valve. This was a transatrial device. So the, the, the surgeon, uh, to put it in, we had to do a small incision in the thorax wall 
and put the device through the RA uh, to get to the, the uh, tricuspid annulus. So this is the first one. I think we did about six or eight of these. Uh, and then we came to get uh, trans, like uh, venous access devices, so trans, transfemoral access. So that's the Edwards Evoke device and the cardio valve, which is the one you can apply. So the Evoke, I believe we did like 10-ish or something like that. Um, and then the cardio valve, I believe we did eight or so. So these two devices are done by different companies and they're crimped and then put into the transfemoral axis. Uh, they have, as you can see, the design is a little different, but the idea is the same. It's a now outer middle stent and with a with leaflet of the valve inside. And the way it anchors to the annulus is that it has here little um, like grippers. And this one has little middle teeth that comes out that grasps the leaflet. So it, 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 it grasps the leaflet to hold in place. So that's how it holds in place. And, and this other one, which is a little different, the Topaz um, device. So we put in one a few months ago, and we're going to put in another one next Tuesday. So this one is different. It's a self-expandable valve. A bit like a like a tabby core valve, so it's also crimped. It's also fully uh, transfemoral, and it expands. And this one has no grippers, but has two skirts: uh, an atrial skirt here and a ventricular skirt. And it holds in place with radial force of the device, and not by leaflet grasping. So it's a little it's a little different. So so this one, and then this one is the Intrepid, where Probably we'll start implanting these ones later, maybe in the fall, but we will have access to this one as well. So these are all the, the, the placement devices. And then finally, we have, uh, this is a new one we, we got uh, access to or will soon be doing a case. It's called the cry valve. So it's a cable device. Um, there is a stent here that we place into the SVC. And there's a little here, a spacer device that's connected to it. So this device we feel will benefit patients that have a very large tricuspid valve annulus that cannot uh, hold in place one of these devices and that the leaflets are too far apart to use a clip. So this is, um, I guess, the newest spacer device. So what it is really is that there's a spacer device and inside the spacer, this kind of, um, sausage-like device. Inside, there's a valve. Uh, so, and it holds in place through the stenting. This is what keeps it mobile. So, the leaflets of the tricuspid valve collapse on the, the spacer device, and the flow can go through inside through the valve. So, it's kind of, um, you know, it's kind of a dual mechanism. We used to have the Forma device, and maybe you may remember that. Uh, it was kind of a spacer device as well, and was attached to the apex of the right ventricle, and was really free floating to the annulus, and the leaflets of the valve would co op on the spacer device. Uh, but that has been retired as a technology. We believe this one should be doing that. So, um, so we're screening a few patients to see um, see who would benefit the most from the device. So this is all the devices we have access to uh, at Saint Michael's. Um, so to give again numbers, uh, we do about 15-ish, uh, 15 to 20 pure tricuspid valve intervention. And we also um, treat the tricuspid valve with clips when we do combine mitral and tricuspid cases. We do about 20 to 30 cases a year. So that's about our numbers. So, as I said, all these devices are still under experimental kind of data. So, there are no formal randomized controlled data. They're not abroad, but we do feel that it seems to be working anecdotally because all the patients we follow we see in clinic. And there are also a bit of registry data that's out there. So, this is a worldwide experience. It was uh, a European, American, Canadian site. So, um, it's called the Tri Valve Registry. So what they 
did that we lumped all patients around the world that underwent a transcatheter tricuspid valve intervention and just followed them in time and see how how was the technology work, how did it go, how did the patient feel after. So as you can see, here's a breakdown of all the devices that's been studied. Um, and as you can see, the majority of the patients have received the clip. So the data or the outcomes of um, these procedures was pretty good. Um, compared to medical therapy, um, the patients did well. The symptoms improved with no doubt. The procedure itself, regardless what it was, was associated with low mortality or not so much higher than what they would have done with medical therapy. And the procedure themselves were quite successful, like 73% of success rate is, is quite acceptable for, for this type of technology. So patients did uh, have less uh, heart failure exacerbation after and did, did um, also survive longer than compared to those who did not receive the procedure. So it's, it's very encouraging. So, um, so the two technology we use the most, as I said, is trans, uh, transcatheter repair with the clips and replacement. So when we screen patients in the clinic, it's always having that in mind. Is this patient more suitable for a clip or is this patient more suitable for a replacement? And all we will base our you know, assessment on the imaging and the patient's um, you know, clinical features as well. So I think as a whole, uh, what stood out is we compare these two technologies head to head and what kind of guides us to work towards one way or the other is that tricuspid valve repair with CLIP as a general is a safe procedure. So it's under general anesthesia, it's done all through um, the catheters and through the veins. So the risk of complication is quite low. Um, the clip is retrievable. We can clip it, and if we don't like the result, we can take it out and reposition it. So, so it's very safe, and uh, so it, you know, we know right away if we're working, and it's pretty safe. We can replace it, and and the rate of SLVA, which is single leaflet detachment. So, you put the clip and deploy it, and then the leaflet rips, or the the, the clip was not really placed at the right place, and then one of the leaflets sl slips out which is a known complication, but it's, it's, it's quite low. So, so we're cautious about it. And you know, we look at imaging with that the echo to make sure we grasp the ability. So as a general, this is it, it's quite safe as a procedure. So um, replacement um, is not as safe as you can see. Obviously, the patients are a little different, but it seems to be there are more complications to a replacement. There's a more complications uh, regarding the post-op RV dysfunction, which is a big deal. Um, we have also uh, some bleeding issues. Um, patients with long-standing advanced tricuspid valve also have liver issues because the tricuspid is related to the, the liver function. So it gets what we call cardiac cirrhosis or cardiac dysfunction because it's all awful. So when we abolish the TR, often these patients have residual disease and then makes them prone to complications, such as bleeding after, so that's not the nice. Uh, but what's good with replacement is that we're able to get rid of all of the TR. So when you see clips, you've seen cases of tricuspid clips, we've been in the room for four or five hours, and then we got down the TR from torrential to severe. <laughs> we're pretty happy because we know we kind of were, but you know, the, the amount of reduction, we don't know yet if that's enough to make feel better. So that's still, you know, to be to be determined if that's helpful. But with replacement, as you see, there's no more there's no more TR after the device, right? So that kind of may bring other complications that we don't know about yet, and that with time we'll learn to see what it looks like. So so that's really so that's why we keep doing echoes after and looking at the RP dysfunction to see what's going on. So. Uh, we all heard about the triluminate trial, so this this is very this is very exciting, and we'll get um, the first results later this fall. So we'll present the results of this. So this is a randomized control trial. Uh, patients with severe tricuspid regurgitation, functional, that 
are appropriate for, for getting a clip will either uh, get a clip or be in the medical therapy, follow them for a year and see how what the outcome changes. So um, there were 400 and, uh, 450 patients were enrolled in, in each of these arms. Um, and also, so it's randomized control. And there was also a single arm of 100 patients of patients with not perfect tricuspid anatomy, not perfect, perfect to go into the randomized trial, but good enough you think you can help them with CLIP. So it's kind of uh, 100 patients that have received CLIP and then that can follow it also. Uh, so, um, so we screened a lot of these patients and we'll, we'll know the results as well. So this is very exciting. It will be the first a randomized control trial looking specifically at the tricuspid valve. There are two others uh, randomized control trials that are uh, on the way, um, but this is the first one. It's the big, the biggest one, so very exciting. So, TR, like knowing all of this, knowing all the natural history of the disease, knowing a bit more about the surgical outcomes, the transcatheter outcomes. Um, so we. It's kind of backwards what happened with, with tricuspid reutilization because um, for aortic stenosis, for example, we knew what the disease are in aortic stenosis and then we, we developed treatment to fix it and then see how it goes. Tricuspid, all we kind of did it backwards. We kind of saw this is something important, we developed all these devices, and then we kind of at the same time go back and see, well, wait a minute, what is TR exactly, where it's coming from, how does it impact, how does it impact the other structures of the heart. And we kind of, we went along the way, so it's kind of backwards that way. So what's a bit unresolved, I guess, is we, it's not super clear whether TR, it starts with TR and then you get sick or you get all these, it's a bystander, like you have other diseases and that results in TR and that's what makes you sick. So this causality, at this point, it's not it's not crystal clear yet, but we can obviously see that patients have remodeling, and the TR itself does affect the the heart, the hemodynamic and the structures of the heart. So we we see this in the echo lab all the time, right? The, uh, regarding the RV size, when you got high pulmonary hypertension, whether it's related to the TR or related to something else. The RV is, is, is huge, it's globular, it's spherical, it's enlarged, it's tilted. So the, the remodeling of the, the, the ventricle does change it. A bit like the mitral valve, when you have functional mitral uh, regurgitation, it's kind of get pulled away from the ventricle. It's a bit the same, the same thing for the tricuspid. So, so this is a, the pattern of RV remodeling, it's something a bit new that we kind of kind of seem to appreciate and then we'll know a bit more about it. And also, the, how the annulus dilates is also another way. So it doesn't dilate in a, in a you know, symmetrical way. What we see, especially on T studies, is that the way the remodels kind of push it towards the posterior lateral aspect of the annulus. So, so this is important to know because when we do the echoes, then you know, using X-plane, biplane views, or looking at the info view, and then looking at the four chamber views gives us two different dimensions. So we can appreciate these, you know, the, the biggest axis of the, of the annulus and which way it's going, right? So probably this is more appreciated on the info. So that's that. So, so a lot of, lot of research still going on in this area, and it's really interesting. So, and the other aspect that we still don't know yet is when should a patient be treated? So we see a lot of patients with TR. Um, we see patients that have really grown out big ventricles, torrential TR, everything's dysfunctional. So there's kind of a spectrum where it's a progression of disease. So when, do, when should we treat it before it's too late and there's a point of no return? That also we don't know yet. We know it, it's very obvious when the RV's down and the TR is all but, and when there's severe TR and the ventricle is still working, but we're not nuanced enough to know exactly when we treat it. And with, in the few years, we'll gather more, more data on this and we'll be able to see. Whereas, again, it's very important to have on the echo really great all of these, the, the impact of the TR on the ventricle and helps us determine if we should treat a patient or not. 
So um, on the ECHOS, especially looking at the TR severity, the annulus size, what the valve looks like, the morphology, the tenting, uh, the RV we're modeling, um, and the size of the, the RV and the uh, RVSP also. So this is very important. So um, who, which patients would benefit the most from um, an intervention? Uh, that again, like I said, we don't know yet. We're not very refined in it. But for the patients we treat that have symptoms, uh, we, in our minds, we kind of break it to this. Can we do a clip or should, can we do a replacement? The most important factor is the anatomy of the valve. So the echo will pretty much the most guide us to us one or the other, once the clinical need is needed. Um, so I've put here some descriptors, some clinical descriptors. Um, these here from the tier comes from the, in, uh, the inclusion criteria from the uh, triluminate trial. So patients that were eligible to be enrolled had more than moderate to severe PR, symptoms, a PAP less than 60 on echo, uh, TV uh, malpractition gap of less than one centimeter, an EF that's more than 20, and an RV and diastole diameter of the four chamber of less than 60. So that was the inclusion criteria. And patients that we more leans more towards a replacement, um, then uh, we kind of have to make sure the uh, valve area is within range for the device. We have to make sure the RV function is not too depressed, which would put us in trouble um, after the procedure, that they're okay for anticoagulation as it's mandatory after replacement, and then the liver function is, is not to impair again for these uh, post op So, um, Again, going into more detail of what actually are the cutoffs of the, um, of the different echo parameters we have. This is, comes from the tri valve registry. So they, in the, in the registry, we looked at all the echoes, all the TEs, and tried to kind of tease out which parameter, which echo parameter is, is significant for a procedural success. So these are the four ones that seem to kind of be the most significant. Um, not that these are firm criteria as patients that does not necessarily fit in this, we still could consider, but kind of gives us a guideline of what kind of, of anatomy we're looking for. So, so patients tend to do better when the TR jet was anterior septal. We tend to do better when the TR EOA was not super, super big, more than 70. The leaflet um, height, the tenting, should not be too extreme. As you can see in pulmonary hypertension patients, when the tenting, the valve is way up there. And the leaflet gap, uh, while well, the smaller, the better, because it just makes it easier to grasp the leaflet. And, uh, so this is interesting. So, um, so we use T and, and, and trans, well, transthoracic and T. This is really based on this. And we also use CT scan um, more for replacement to have an accurate measurement of the annulus, the IVC right atrial relationship when we need to steer down the device from the IVC to the valve. So there are, but mainly, mainly based on it. So um, here are a few targets that we measure specifically in our reports. Uh, Transthoracic report should include these, these measurements. So we should always measure the annular um, dimension of the four, four chamber view. Uh, we should always report the tenting height, again, of the four chamber view. If there's pulmonary hypertension, um, the TR jet. Uh, RV dysfunction. Uh, TAPC uh, was the most, the, the measurement of RV dysfunction that was the most associated with uh, procedural success. Um, you can kind of see the limitation though of TAPC, uh, especially if you have a big ventricle, the, the M mode may not be quite aligned with it. Uh, but this, despite that, it's, it's still from the data seems to be the most associated. 
when the RV is really dilated, I then measure a FAC, a fractional area change, because then you get the full area, right? So it's easier to see. Uh, we should always quantify the TR severity. We should measure the malcoaptation gap. And if there's a pacer lead, really image it and see what, if it interacts with the widgets or not. So those are the key features that should always be present in the report uh, when, looking for, when screening patients for a Chinese bomb infection. So here's um, those few examples um, uh, of the measurements. And, how the ministry. Okay, so here again, um, as you can see here, and here are the cutoffs and values that we use. Um, see how the beam here can be hard to get, um, you know, in the real motion of the animal. So with um, Patrick, um, we're gonna this year try to use the venture point to get 3D volumes of the RV. So um, as you remember, the, we take 2D images and then after we post process and identify with the device, with the structure. So we get a 3D render of the integral and get it an in diastole and end systole. So we'll get a, a, a RGEF. So, um, we're gonna start this year. So we're gonna, all the patients we see on Mondays or most of the patients we can, we'll, we'll try to do that. Try to get more information regarding that. So here's, uh, so with regards to quantification, um, although PISA EROA, ERO seems to underestimate probably twofold what the, accurate, the actual ERO is. So um, because the uh, jet is not spherical, when the TR, the, the regurgitant or the area is kind of star-shaped or not a, a nice spherical, so we tend to underestimate about half what it actually is. We still use it, we still report it, uh, but that's to keep in mind. And a lot of labs um, in the US, uh, Becky, Han, and all, are looking for other ways on ECHO using 3D, using biplanes, using other techniques, volumetric, trying to see how we can be the most accurate to truly get that ERA. Obviously, these patients can't do MRI, which would work well uh, on all of them, so we're trying to find a way to do it. But at this time, we use PISA ERA and it seems to be quite working. So we should use this five grade um, um, quantification severity scheme. Uh, so there are two extra uh, categories beyond severe. Um, and most of the patients we see um, in the clinic have these massive and torrential TR. So, so this, we should be using this scheme, not only to, not only to um, identify the patient or the severity correctly, but also when we treat them and then we compare from baseline to post-procedure, um, if we have a decrease in two grades um, or less than moderate, is that what we define as a procedural success? So that's why it's important to get these, these right. Okay, so this is, I guess, the, the most, I guess, novel, I don't know, novel thing or the most thing we will look in very particularly when we do the TE is the anatomy of the valve. So we've learned that the tricuspid valve is not just a tricuspid valve. It can have all these different configurations. So this is obviously, we need TE to see that. Um, ideally transgastric TE and also the 3D and the NPRs also will try to identify them. So we really want to know, not only for academic purposes, not only for that, but also for the procedural success. When we plan, let's say, a clip procedure, we try to respect the anatomy of the valve. So knowing if there are different scallops and where the TR jet is coming from, we can plan and decide we need to put a clip here between the S and the P, or we need to put a clip here between the S and the A. So, or these ones, it also can be complicated when when regards to planning a clip procedure, when there's two scallops of the septal leaflet, we may not be able to put two clips on the, this segment of the septal leaflet. We may need to put a, a clip from the 
this segment, the S1 and the A1, and maybe and the S2 or the P2, or the S2 and the A2. So, so when we uh, screen all the procedure with the interventional team, we always look at this and plan the procedure. So to, to identify them correctly, then speak the same language, and we can kind of communicate more clearly what needs to be done. So you can see here the incidence of um, the different configuration. And we define the transition from the interior to the posterior uh, with its relationship with the interior papillary muscle. So that's what defines the other scalp. So, so this paper, just look at it in detail. It, it, it's quite comprehensive. So here's a few examples. So this is a tricuspid. Uh, from the transgastric view, so you can see three scallops, and here you can see a quadri valve here. There two, the posterior has two scallops, so you can see it's different, right? So, like most cases of trichus, a functional tricuspid valve, the problem often is the septal leaflet that's quite tethered. So you can see the mouth coaptation gap here is central and related to the septal leaflet. Same as this one. So here is a, a good, that's a nice case. This is a bicuspid one. So you can see it really well up to the 3D. It only has two commissures. You know, there's only two commissures in the big AP. So it's quite nice. And um, you can see off this NPR here, I'm going to really appreciate. There's only two scallops. So this is a, this is a perfect ca case for clipping. Because by putting a clip, you just bring everything, you can zip it, throw everything quite down. That's a good case. So the transgastric view, when we do the T, we spend, you know, uh, we spend a lot of time getting it really right so we can understand what the anatomy is. So on the transgastric here, not only can we see the configuration of the leaflets, but we can also see the chordal insertion. So all these white things here, this white thing here, are all cords. So we can't put cords. We have to put leaflet. So we have to really get it on fat. So we can see um, where we can grasp the meaty part. We also get the meaty part of the leaflet, not just grabbing cords, but grabbing the meaty part. So that's where we need to as well. So here you can see we put a clip into your septal. You can see here the septal leaflet going towards the clip and the interior leaflet, the leaflet itself getting into the clip that's closed. So that's a good grasp. We've got all the leaflets. So that's nice. So the NPR is good for screening. We use these key views for the procedure, because this is usually where the view we use to close the clip. So when we do the baseline echo, we want to make sure we can see the leaflets on every single view to make sure that when we know when we get into the case, we can actually see the leaflets. There's no shadowing from the septum or, or any um, cords that's there. So you can appreciate here um, this septal and posterior view you see the posterior leaflet really clearly here, and you see a portal insertion here. So uh, this doesn't really matter for clipping because we grasp the leaflets here. But if we were to do, let's say, a replacement valve, when we put the, the wires in, we want to make sure the wires or the device doesn't get caught into the subvalvular apparatus. We try to stay in the middle. So it's very important to know ahead if there's cords beneath. That can get our device can get entangled. So not that it will preclude the procedure, but at least we know that it's there. We can steer the device away from it so we don't get stuck. So so the 2D image is quite important. And then then we put color here. So um, when we put color, we can see where the jet's coming from. So when we clip, uh, we want to obviously reduce where the majority of the TR jet's coming from. So I want to make sure we have the right place. And we're choosing these things right. So we map it narrowly. So this patient here has functional trichospid regurgitation that's quite broad towards the posterior septal aspect of the valve, which we just saw, moving this 
more towards the central aspect of the valve. There's a lot of color again. And then when we move it forward some more, interior, posterior, uh, and septal interior, sorry, there's a lot of color still coming from this commissure. So it's very a broad chocolate jet. So this we know the best for these views. That's that. And then, um, so here's, so this bicommissural view is quite important. Uh, because we can also see the scallops of the valve here. You see all these bumps here? So, so we wanted to put this clip in anterior septal, and the target is this bump. And when we image this bump, we see beautiful leaflets of good length uh, that we're able to grasp. So we, when we steer the device in, we make sure we fall right, right on top of where we want to grasp it, like here. And then we're able to close the clip and make sure we confirm that the leaflets are really preserving. So this, uh, so this is why this view is so important. So the MPR is game changer because it decreases the amount of manipulation we do during the case uh, because we can get kind of these uh, explained views and the three D view at all in the same screen. Uh, we can we can see everything, so we don't need to move the probe. It decreases the risk of injury, and so it, it's quite good. And nowadays, with the new Epic, these, the the frame rate and the the processing of it's so fast and it's so advanced that we get beautiful pictures. So this really changes the procedure. So we can see here we can get all these views at the same time, and obviously we can move these planes and all the views. So now in this red plane here, which is this red view. I'm imaging in the central aspect of the valve, so we're seeing S and A, but I can move this towards this way and image septal and posterior. So all just with the just with the tracking ball, I can move all this. And with this blue line here, I can move it up and down and truly get a transgastric view. So all that without moving the probe. So it's pretty good. So this is, uh, this, we do it for screening because it's kind of nice, but we also do it for replacement. So it's the same thing, it's that uh, NPR view, but we can move these planes, the dotted ones, further apart or further closer. So when we introduce the device, we can image at every height in the atrium and get to the valve. So um, if the images is quite good, like it is on this case, then we can even use NPR to uh, grasp the leaflets, which here the image quality is, is quite nice. So you can kind of grasp it all, already. So transgastric is to confirm. So beautiful pictures, high frame rates, 2D is, is still very helpful. Okay, so I'll just kind of finish off in showing you two, two or three interesting cases. So here's how the imaging is really important again. So this patient has a mechanical mitral. So it shadows a lot the tricuspid valve, right? We can't see at all the leaflet. So if we were just to leave it like that, we couldn't do the procedure. We can't, we can't see the leaflet. But by pushing the, the probe lower and the mid is a phrygeal view, you can get rid of the shadowing of the of the mitral valve and look at how you can see the leaflets more clearly. So it's the same patient, same view, just pushing the, the probe lower into the esophagus. So this is really a game changer. We really have to spend time and try to find all these views. Because if we can't see, we can't do. So the patient will be turned down for the procedures. Um, so this is what his transgastric look like, a big functional tricuspid regurgitation with a lot of color with mild clock fiction gap in the anterior septal and the central aspect of the valve. So um, these uh, were quite nice. You can see the leaflets quite clearly. They're long enough. The gap is not wide um, excessively, so we can use uh, clips for that. There are a lot of color coming from there. So um, the 3D here confirms this. So you have the anterior septal TR jet. So this patient, uh, we decided it was good for a, a clip. Uh, we used the 
uh, check us different here. So you can see here, we can image very well the leaflets, we can uh, confirm that the leaflets are well grasped and use uh, the transgas review to make sure we grasp all the leaflets. So actually we've got a really good result with this one. Um, so uh, if you have a lead here, uh, it's important to measure the trajectory of the lead. So this is another patient. Uh, and the lead, the question is, does it interfere with the leaflet mobility? And is the lead the cause of the TR or is it also have functional and lead induced? So when we put the cursor right on the lead, you can see here there's a lot of color coming from the lead and you can see the impingement of the interaction, I get, I'd rather say, of the, the lead with the septal leaflet here. So this is lead-induced trichospid regurgitation and is therefore not a good case for a clip, uh, but we could consider replacement with this patient. Or we can try to extract the lead and, and go for procedure. There are different options. So this is, on the contrary, a patient that has a lead, but it's not interfering with the, with the leaflet. Uh, mobility. So it's free floating in the central valve, and you can see a very dilated tricuspid valve annulus. So this patient, the lead is, is although bouncing around, uh, it's not to be So we can, we can work with this. Yeah. So, so this patient here also has a lead. And there's a lot of TR coming from the lead, but also um, it is quite yanked here in the back of the valve, and you see the interior and uh, the interior and the septal leaflet are quite mobile and flapping. But um, so so the TR is almost exclusively again coming from that lead. So the 3D is useful here. We can see. So there's no point of putting a clip here because there's no TR here. So again, it's going to catch it. Technology. Um, so, the lastly, the only thing we cannot do with trans catheter devices is flail leaflets. So, because most of the valve replacement needs to grasp the leaflet, if the leaflet is, emo, is very mobile, you can't grab it and can't. So, it, it, the device will stay in place. And often, if you have a big flail segment like this patient here, the mouth coaptation gap is too large for it. Too far apart, so we can't use this. So these patients actually, um, this patient particularly, uh, got kicked by a horse 20 years ago, and flailed his interior leaflet, and was asymptomatic for 20 years. So he did was just monitored, and now he came to us because he had heart failure now. So um, the question is, could we fix it with devices, and we can. But this patient. What well, had no other diseases otherwise. So these patients were sent to surgery. So we'll see what they do. Yeah. So uh, I hope we uh, covered the, these objective and have a better, we was a spiral discussion regarding TR and, and transaturated in the body. All right, so any questions? Geraldine, thank you very much. That was awesome.